So there are many, many things that you can do as a producer which will overwrite your wine. And this is why my late father came back and said, look, son, if you talk terroir the way you do, and you make three passes with two bins, you manipulate and you, do, you no longer get the real picture of the terroir. And that's when he said, go for an experiment and block pick mm -hmm. your best parcel and then compare it to the wines that you have made by means of multiple selections. And this we did in 2003 in the Schmidt parcel of the Schlossberg and it was a wow effect. And ever since we do the single block, no intervention um, micro parcels. This is a, a prime example. You see back, this is what I told you, the rock is not very stable because it crumbles easily. So this was scraped and fixed and hopefully this will stay for the next 200 years. You see the anchors here? They were put in in the 1800s and the rock was so porous and it came down so it had to be secured and these were put in six years ago hopefully to last for a couple of hundred years. This is a former sea bottom if you've already heard it 400 million years ago this was an ocean and it's the sediment the silt that was compressed over millions of years so you have a lot of uh, fossils in them, you have uh, organic matter, you have uh, mostly loam, basically, and it looks like a wafer. It is grayish blue where, where you have no iron or mineral. And here's a very good example of a virgin piece of blue Devonian slate. And this is a good example. It works. You see this? It is brittle. You can break it with your hands, you can crack it very easily and this so it weathers rather easily and you can imagine frost sometimes heat water seeping in and then the fine roots following this is how the roots can actually penetrate and get way down when i tell people you know roots go into the rock they look at me like he's blah blah i had too much riesling but in fact if you look here you see this is a very good example of broken slate and you can easily Scrape this. See this? And here we have a piece of iron where it's exposed, it rusts. So that's how it looks underground. And this is what makes a taste of minerality. That's cool blue slate. This is why Riesling, most of Riesling grown in slate soil, has this cool, like an early morning dew, like a fresh mountain stream. Clarity. That's crispness, not just from the grapes, but certainly from the low pH. This is low pH, um, and it translates into citrus and apple in the juice and in the wines. This is something we don't add. This is this stuff. And you'll see if you look to the left, everywhere, when you dig, when you scrape, it takes you one meter, maximum 150 and you hit the bedrock. So the Austrians say Urgestein. Right. This is the ancient bedrock. And on top of it, you have a top soil, soil, which is basically broken, chipped slate with organic matter. That's for the first two, three years. And then the roots need to drill into the rock or they need to find the, the crevices and the cracks to make the way down. Um, which has yeah. just been replanted. Yeah. That's uh, the border vineyard. Basically the green uh, unplanted is Zeltingen and the planted gray is Wehlen. Right. And then you can see how, you know, almost homogeneous the slope is in Wehlen, mm -hmm. except for that cliff where the mm -hmm. sun actually sits. Mm -hmm. And also the resemblance between the two in terms of falling into the river and then you see the golden gate of Valen and you see that side arm of the Mosel and that's where the vineyards retreat you have the meadows you have the village and then comes Grach with a different microclimate with a slightly different soil more loam more water supply it's a beautiful spot if like I wasn't you. living here I'd come here it's a vacation <laughs> sure. um, And this is how it looks underneath and if you don't do something it's all white and then it goes into 
the vine and then it will also get the fruit. Yeah. Like here it did, see this? Uh-huh. Out. Kaput. Yeah. So what happens? It just eats it up? Yeah, it, they dry up. Same here. Pero. Gone. Mm. The, these are healthy, see this? Mm -hmm. Healthy, healthy, healthy. What I just showed you had some downy mildew or peonospa as we say. Here, yeah, this is, this is. Oh yeah. Pero. Not good. This was, you can see it's, it's. Oh, sauerwurm. Oh, look at this. Oh, hello. This is a moth that lays eggs and it will destroy, it will nest in the bunch. See, it's alive and kicking here. Mm -hmm. And if you get plenty of these critters, you lose quite a bit of uh, grapes, which is why we hang, I'll show you, the pheromone traps. Right. Which should confuse the males so that they don't find the females, but obviously this guy made it. Yeah. Don't film me killing an uh, ammo. An amino? Is it amino? <laughs> amino. <laughs> This is a capsule with, with a pheromone which resembles the smell that the females spread so the males will search for the female but they find plastic. Um, in essence it's a biological means uh, or chemical means to disturb the male critters so they can't find the females so they don't mate so they don't reproduce. And this is how we save spraying pesticides. That's pretty widely uh, spread around here. Usually in April, you know, two or three days, everybody runs through the slopes and hangs one of these every so many vines. And so the whole area is covered and you have no or limited problems with uh, uh, pests. The thing that we can't control is the weather, and this is why we have more trouble with Peronospora or downy mildew this time around. Last year was an easy piece of cake, but this year it's, it's not so easy. Yeah, yeah humidity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't let up, that's the problem. You know, tonight we might have another sun thunderstorm, then it you know, could be a dry day, and then the weekend could bring another one, and the humidity is really that uh, creates problems. Is there anything you can do? aeration this is why you plant wider this was a dying vineyard we replanted some 19 years ago um, whereas a little where you see the stakes you can tell mm -hmm. they fall into the river that's the mm. old portion that's 80 plus years old this one was over 100 years and it was going out so we had to replace it and rather than planting one meter times one meter like everything else is this is 150 mm -hmm. and so you have more air movement with more air movement you have less risk of a fungus infection that's one step and the other step is to do the foliage work you can see here it's already done what we do as they grow you cut the excess canes and you tie next year's fruit canes to the vine this is what we call Einzelfall or Moselfall it's the old Roman way of doing it in the steep slope so basically next year's budwood or fruit canes are here so as they grow we will do another two bands around it and then in late july early august the excess foliage will be cut because if you don't cut them you have a jungle and then again you have no air movement and then you have diseases so it's all about health of the vines What is the ideal number of, of vineyard people per hectare? It depends on whether you have the single pole or whether you have wire trellis. Um, we, in the height of the summer, have about a dozen people mm -hmm. uh, and that works. Mm -hmm. Obviously this is a lot more labor intensive than a wire trellis where you just swing the, the wires around yeah. the vines. This you need to do manually. You sort through the mm -hmm. shoots, you choose which one to cut and which one to attach to the vine here. This is easy because there is only two. Those two would be next year's budwood. Right. And we saw the wire trellising yeah. in use yesterday at uh, in the bottom part of the Laurentius line. Yeah, and, and wire trellis is faster. Mm -hmm. This is, but 
wire trellis here would be extremely difficult because it's so, so steep. Plus yeah. you could not, except for with a winch, but there's no road on top. So if you don't have a road where you can bring a tractor, the tractor has a winch, there is no use. That's why we have a, a old fashioned single pole trellis in here. If you want to see old vines, you look if they are straight and strong. Now oh, there's so much foliage here. See this? See this bent thing here? This is an old vine. It's it's away from the pole. Ah, this, yeah, is, yeah. Mm -hmm. this is minimum. 70 years old. This vineyard is probably on average 70 year old with some vines older than 100 and some of them replaced as they died. And here you see what happens if you don't hurry up. Riesling likes to, Riesling is attached to people or people attached to it, they like it and, and vice versa. So you come in two weeks, this will be a jungle. There's another one where you can see, this is not the thick, thick, trunk but rather feeble right here old and here's one that is so old it's getting his la its last chance here this year that's going out we will try to regenerate the vine from this shoot mm -hmm. and if it works we'll keep it if it dies we will have to put a new one next to it and that's the principle that's widely applied here you don't rip out an entire vineyard if you have enough vines that are still going you will put a new vine next to a dying vine and in doing so you practice what we call the eternal vineyard like the ewige weinberg uh, just replacing dying vines and not ripping out the entire vineyard but this one is really really old you can see it's still producing some buds down here so this is definitely getting another chance this will be the budwood for next year and if it comes around and, and stays healthy in, in buds then it'll it'll stay in business